Well, with the landfall of Hurricane Fiona and Hurricane Ian, one of the big headlines was the work that was done by hurricane hunters with the Air Force uh, that flew into these amazing storms. And we are lucky enough to get the chance to talk to one of these hurricane hunters. We've got Lieutenant Colonel Jeremy Dehart that's joining us now. So Jeremy, you have an amazing job title to be a hurricane hunter. What exactly do hurricane hunters do? Well, it's a lot like what the what it sounds like. Uh, we go hunt hurricanes. We so my job as the weather officer is to basically direct the crew uh, in the plane to get to the center of the storm. That's our primary responsibility. So um, we will actually go fly to uh, an estimated center coordinates, and then um, I will, as we enter the storm environment, I will call turns out to the the pilots and the navigators up front, um, 10 degrees to the right, five degrees to the left, um, watching the winds, watching the data come um, into the airplane and use that to what we call fix the exact center of the storm. And so um, once we have that information, we pass that on the hurricane center and they're able to, to tell us a lot about the intensity and the location and the forecast for the storm. And that's our primary responsibility. So as a meteorologist, I would love to do what you get to do. But when I talk to other people that aren't into uh, meteorology as much, they think you are just crazy to be flying a plane through a hurricane. What is the turbulence and just the, the flight through a hurricane? What, what does that feel like while you are up there working? Uh, it can be pretty smooth sometimes, believe it or not, uh, especially some of the, the more developed hurricanes where they're just kind of stabilized. Um, you know, you're not getting... They're not rapidly intensifying, so the the atmosphere can kind of be stable and relatively smooth outside of flying through the eye wall. And then you get uh, missions like we experienced last week with Ian, right as it was making landfall, continued intensification, rapid intensification, and uh, so you get those pockets of turbulence. It's it's a lot, you know, kind of like a, a roller coaster. Um, flying through a car wash at the same time where you're just inundated with precipitation and then you get pockets of turbulence where it's it's a kind of a series of updrafts and downdrafts where you can you know lose or gain several hundred feet a thousand feet in altitude going through an eye wall in instantaneously almost and so they saw that with Ian last week um, my mission um, landfall mission of hurricane michael back in 2018 was very similar so we've seen a lot of those type of storms unfortunately the last uh, several years approaching u.s landfall rapidly intensifying right up until landfall all right so you made that sound a lot calmer than it is what does a thousand foot drop instantaneously feel like in turbulence when you're in a plane <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's hard to describe uh, with words. Uh, you really have to ex experience it. But um, again, it's it's kind of like a series of updrafts and downdrafts. So the plane will just kind of be flying along and then you hit, you know, kind of a, a zero G where basically you're just flying straight up and then you can slam back down again and back up and back down until you get through the worst of it. And so if you can imagine what that feels like any roller coaster that you've been on where you kind of experience some of that pity your stomach feeling that times about 10. <laughs> wow. Uh, so one other thing that Ian had with the, the, the crew that went through and had all the turbulence was was hail that they dealt with. Is that something y'all deal with very often inside of hurricanes? Not very often, um, but again, with some of the strongest storms um, and we've seen a lot of them, you know, cat four cat five storms the last uh four or five years that's where we're seeing it in the eye wall um that's kind of a characteristic of rapidly intensifying uh tropical systems is that you get some of that uh some hail the turbulence we spoke of and and lightning and seeing a lot of lightning in the eye wall as well so we, we talk about the eye wall where it's the most intense but you get to see something that very few people do when you move from the eye wall into the eye. Explain the, the stadium look and just how awe-inspiring it is being inside of that eye of that storm. Yeah, again, it's, uh, that's hard to describe with words too. Pictures and pictures don't, even videos that, that you all have seen out there don't even do it justice. But um, with these strongest hurricanes, you immediately break out 
and during the day, you know, clear blue sky above you and around you. And like you said, Brady, the, the stadium effect, kind of imagine yourself standing in the middle of a football field and what the, the stadium seating would look like up and around you, all the way around you. And that's what that's what it looks like and it feels like inside the storm. It's, it is awe-inspiring. So you're not only just flying into a storm, you are doing a ton of meteorological work, right, that really helps folks learn about those hurricanes. That's right, yep. And uh, so as we're flying through it, the, the plane is constantly collecting data from the storm, both at our flight level for, for a hurricane mission that's typically around 10,000 feet. So we're gathering uh, wind speed, wind direction, uh, temperature, humidity, and pressure levels at the flight level um, as we're crossing, con making continuous uh, crossing pattern through the storm. And then we're also releasing uh, instruments from the plane with what's called a drop sign, which is uh, we release it from from the plane all the way down to the sea surface and it's capturing that same data all the way down to the the surface level and so um, as we're flying through we can get a really good picture of what the storm is doing both at the flight level and the sea surface so when it comes to hurricanes we're talking about evacuating and getting people out of harm's way your job is completely the opposite how crazy is it to think that everyone's running away from it and you're going to fly right through that thing that's right. And, you know, but we do what we do ultimately to um, provide that crucial data to the public to first of all to the Hurricane Center so they can uh, put out the best products available. And of course, you know, everyone's familiar with those products, uh, the, the cone of uncertainty, which is used largely used to um, uh, issue those evacuation warnings. And so what we do flying into the storm is to keep the public out of harm's way. And, uh, you know, you're a meteorologist as well. And how cool is that to be involved with something like this where, you know, hands on, you're helping to save lives and prepare folks for an, a major event like this? Yeah, I mean, I, I love it, to, to be honest. As a meteorologist, you know, it's, it's really uh, tip of the spear type stuff, we like to say in the military, um, to be able to uh, not just to be able to experience uh, weather in that kind of environment, but to be able to use that and know um, how critical it is and how you can see the direct impact of, of what we do, again, to uh, keep the public safe. So it's been an overall quiet hurricane season up until here recently, and Fiona and Ian have changed the story dramatically. Let's go back to Hurricane Fiona. Tell, just give us our viewers a kind of a firsthand view what it was like flying through Hurricane Fiona. Yeah, uh, so uh, Fiona, of course, started uh, pretty far to the east in the Atlantic. And so we were flying uh, Fiona well before it was developed as, as uh, basically an invest type mission. And we flew Fiona, watched it basically um, from birth um, until it, it grew into a monster, a major hurricane in the Caribbean, eventually uh, crossed uh, the western tip of Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and eventually continued to curve to the north uh, past Bermuda and again made another landfall in Nova Scotia, Canada. So it, it was over a week, a week to 10 days, I believe we were flying Fiona. So y'all y'all investigate, you know, like I said, from the very beginning all the way through. Now, not all these storms become major hurricanes like Ian was. How, how big of an effort is it for your squadron and your group of uh, pilots and meteorologists when you get a major potential U.S. landfall like uh, Hurricane Ian was? Yeah, I mean, this is this is what we do. So we prepare for it every year, but it, it of course, involves a lot of planning, um, a lot of logistics in the background just to be able to keep um, both crews and planes rotating and in the air. And um, especially when you get into a situation like we had the last couple of weeks with Fiona and Ian, where we're flying two, two storms simultaneously uh, at the same time. And so we had crews down the Caribbean. We had some crews um, up toward New England where when uh, it was, you know, Fiona was making landfall again in Canada. And then right on its tails, uh, we had Ian uh, as it was um, being born in the Caribbean. So. That's a lot of 
uh, use of uh, people and resources, and there's a lot of uh, people in the background uh, working to make that happen. So y'all are uh, reservists. So when we're not in hurricane season, what, what are you doing to, to keep busy when it's not out flying through hurricanes? Well, I'm actually full time with the unit. So we are a reserve unit. Um, we have uh, about half of our unit is full time and half is uh, part time citizen airmen. And so a lot of those guys, you know, they have jobs that they go, they do it, you know, you know, we have pilots that fly for Delta and FedEx and come back and fly hurricanes during the, the core of, of tropical season. Um, but we also have, uh, which uh, a mission that a lot of people aren't as fami familiar with is in the winter, we have a winter season operations plan that we adhere to as well. And so we will fly missions up the, like the East Coast, for instance, for a threatening nor'easter that's gonna dump a, you know, a couple feet of snow in, in New England. And then also the last couple of years, we've been flying out west over the Pacific for um, atmospheric rivers, which is they, the, the western U.S. gets a um, large majority of their annual precipitation in the months from January to March with those events. And so uh, we've been flying those quite a bit. So uh, the answer is we really don't have much of an, of an off season. Um, so what, one thing we like to do with, with these interviews is just get to talk to people that are in really cool STEM-related careers. So what drove you into your interest into meteorology and the, what, what steered you into becoming a hurricane hunter? Yeah, I've always loved weather from, from since I was a kid. So it was always something I was interested in and I eventually decided to pursue it as a career. Um, I actually spent 12 years on the active duty side of the Air Force as a traditional weather officer, um, you know, giving uh, briefings to air crews and um, writing forecasts for for base bases and, and uh, large uh, operating areas. Um, and so I, uh, before that, I, you know, I'm a degreed meteorologist. So I, I had a, a four year uh, ROTC scholarship from NC State University, and I majored in meteorology. So I'm a, a meteorologist by trade, and it's just something again I've always been interested in, and, and turn it into a, eventually turn it into a career with the hurricane hunters. That, that, that's really awesome. And how, how cool is it just to you know someone like me that I love to get out and chase storms if I can, but I'm stuck here in a TV studio most of the time. But to actually be out there and you know, you're looking at the measurements, but you can look out a window and actually see what you're talking about and the impacts it has. Yeah, I, again, I love that. I love that aspect of it because I've, you know, I, I've done the same type of work that you do, Brady, you know, and a lot of other people, a lot of people in the, in the weather enterprise do. And that's always interesting too, but I mean, to be able to experience it like we do with the hurricane hunters, there's really nothing like it. So your ultimate goal again is to, to help provide data. How, have you, how much have like improvements in technology and improvements in what you all do, have y'all seen how much that's really helped to, you know, to lessen the cone of uncertainty and help provide better forecasts with the data y'all provide? It has, yeah. We, we I've seen some studies uh, recently as much as it's, it seems to have reduced the, the size of the cone by 20 to 30%. And so that's very important when you, when you think of, again, these are the primary tools that the public is is using um, for evacuation orders. And so um, the, it's been found that there's about a million dollars of coastline per per mile of coastline um, that it, it costs the economy and the local the local economy if you know that area has to be evacuated. So any amount of reduction that we can do uh, again serves, serves the public and, and that's what you know, the, the main thing I love about this job. Well, I, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I really appreciate you taking time to talk to us. I, I, I've had fun just listening to you. I've, I was all geeking out with all the people here in the building, how excited I was to finally get to talk to Hurricane Hunter. So uh, appreciate you taking the time. We really appreciate all you do. I know it can be a, a hard job at times and a dangerous job, but we thank you for everything that y'all do to help get this data out. Happy to do it. Good talking with you. All right. Thank you.